So um, thank you for your attention. So um, um, I'm radiation oncologist, um, as um, Dr. Ed Knife said. So um, um, I was asked to um, talk about this topic, um, CNS germ cell tumors. This tumor is uh, a very uncommon tumor uh, as compared to the low-grade glioma, but uh, it has aroused a lot of interest to, uh, to a lot of oncologists and also the surgeons and also the basic scientists. So, okay. so and um, to begin, I would like to uh, highlight the um, special features of this tumor in terms of the epidemiology. So as you can see from here, actually, so um, CNS germ cell tumors had a lot of um, um, peculiar features um, as, um, in terms of geographic differences, gender, ethnic differences. Um, this is um, uh, um, data analysis from the International Agency for Research on Cancer. As uh, you can see from this um, figure, so there's a very e e drastic uh, variations in terms of the epidemiology between the Asian population uh, as compared to the Western populations. So for Japan, so the incidence is around 2.5 per million uh, people, um, and this is um, much higher than the um, US epidemiology, which is only around 0.5 um, um, uh, patients per million people. So, and also, um, there's a slight male predominance, um, especially as far as the p uh, pineal gland tumor is concerned. So, these are the characteristics uh, on the epidemiology. So, for the histological classification, so this is um, CNS germ cell tumor share the same um, theory as the extra cranial uh, gonadal germ cell tumor. So, they all come from uh, uh, origins, the primordial germ cell. And as they uh, try to differentiate, um, the majority, um, as most as 70 to 80%, will go to the uh, seminoma, this germinoma, or in uh, the um, germinoma in the um, intracranial uh, area. So, but um, uh, some of them will go to um, the embryonal lineage, and um, through the embryonal lineage, they will either go to become the teratoma, mature, immature, or teratoma with malignant transformation, or they will differentiate further into choral carcinoma or the yolk sac carcinoma. So for the location, this is really a midline uh, tumor so, um, because um, most of the tumors arises from the pineal or the supracellar regions. So pineal uh, uh, gland um, um, germ cell tumor uh, comprises of uh, almost one half of all the CNS germ cell tumors, and sometimes it can be bifocal or multifocal along the midline. So the bifocal tumors uh, comprises around five to ten percent, and rarely the tumor will also occur in other uh, areas like the pituitary or even at the basal ganglia regions. Depending on the um, locations of a tumor, the tu um, germ cell tumor in the brain can present with a hydrocephalus, um, paranoid syndrome uh, when the tumor is at the pineal region, which is characterized by the upward gaze per uh, paresis, the convergence retraction statements. And also, if it is at the supracellar or pituitary regions, it will present with electrolyte disturbance. So patients may have uh, symptoms of uh, poly uh, polydipsia or um, polyuria. So if it occurs in the basal ganglia regions, then it may present with hemiparesis. For the investigations, um, MRI of the brain and the whole, sp whole spine is important to define the radiological extent of a tumor. And um, this uh, CNS germ cell tumor do have a very useful tumor markers, which can be um, checked at the serum or at the um, CSF. So they are the alpha fetoprotein and the beta HCG. So from the um, CSF, you can also obtain in the cytology to see if there's any um, um, uh, involvement at the spine. And um, in case of doubt, um, sometimes um, tumor mark or tumor biopsy will be necessary. But this is not always the case because uh, in some of the situations, uh, radiological um, uh, features together with um, uh, compatible um, 
tumor marker level will already make a diagnosis of CNS germ cells tumor. So more uh, on the tumor markers. So um, you can check the tumor markers from either serum or the CSF or both. So for the non-germinomious germ cell tumor, um, you have a um, very high level of AFP in case if you are tackling a Yoxap tumor. A choriocarcinoma will have a, a very high level of beta HCG. But for embryonal carcinoma, um, some of these tumors may have uh, elevations of markers, but um, there is also a portion of embryonal carcinomas which are marker negative. For germinoma, so um, alpha fetal protein must be negative because germinoma never secretes AFP. So if there's AFP elevations, then it essentially rules out germinoma. Some of the germinomas are non-secretory, so the HCG level may be negative, but in many of them, they may have contained the syncytiotrophobus elements and they may um, secrete a, a, a low level of uh, beta HCG. But well, if the tumor uh, um, um, volume is big or if there's multi bifocal or even multifocal germinoma, sometimes the HCG level can be as high as more than 100 international units per liter. So um, there are different approaches or protocols um, that um, um, define the diagnosis of intracranial germ cell tumor. But um, nowadays, um, people have apparently come to a consensus uh, for the diagnosis. So in um, 2015, um, there is a consensus statement on the Lancet Oncology, so um, based on the um, national meetings held in 2013. So um, most uh, experts uh, on intracranial germ cell tumors tends to agree that if patients has a uh, AFP or the HCG level below their national protocol thresholds, then well, um, they may require surgical biopsies because uh, negative markers can either be a germ cell tumor or it can either be some other thing else like a pineal cytoma or even ependymoma. So marker negative uh, tumors at the pineal or the supracellular regions do not necessarily mean um, germ cell tumor. On the other hand, if patients has elevations of AFP or XCG above the national thresholds, then they may not require surgical biopsy, and one may go ahead to treat as a germ cell tumor. But there are some pitfalls in adopting this uh, definition. Take for example, the Japanese working group uh, will try to treat um, XCG a uh, germ cell tumor with HCG level higher than 200 international units per liter uh, as germinoma. So, but, and they have come to a very good results. Uh, but on the other hand, the COG group and the CO group will suggest taking the HCG level of more than 50 as a cutoff. And anything above 50 uh, means mm, unfavorable prognosis and they have to be treated as non-germinometers germ cell tumor and there may be the possibilities of overtreatment in this scenario. So, and another uh, scenario is for tumors with XCG level uh, between five to 50 and with a negative AFP, many protocols will say, well, you can treat it as a germinoma. But bear in mind, um, some tumors like embryonal, embryonal carcinoma, they, they may secrete a low level of XCG. So, and so, HCG level between 5 to 50 does not completely eliminate non germinal germ cell tumor. And so, there may be a possibility of, of under-treatment in this case. So, so let's talk about the surgical treatments. So, surgical treatments mm, is uh, mainly for diagnosis at the first presentation. In case if your uh, radiological features and your tumor markers cannot help you to make a clinical diagnosis. And also, surgical treatments is very useful at the second look setting when you have a post-treatment residual disease after your chemotherapy or your radiotherapy. So you're not sure whether uh, um, um, the residual tumor is a viable tumor or non-viable tumor. 
So sometimes tumor with a normal tumor markers after chemotherapy or radiotherapy, they may just represent some mature teratoma elements or even fibrosis that may not need um, more aggressive uh, uh, treatments down the road. So second look surgery is important in this respect. Of course, surgical treatments is also important to relieve the uh, symptoms of hydrocephalus before you go ahead with your chemotherapy or radiotherapy. And in some cases, uh, you have to rely on open craniotomy to um, decompress the tumor or to remove a tumor in case there is post-radiotherapy uh, persistence. So um, let's talk about the geminoma treatment. And, um, so geminoma treatment is a high, so geminoma is a highly curable uh, tumor. So without it alone, the survival is more than 90%. It is dose response dependent. So um, without it alone, uh, it's um, 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 evaluated that more than 40 gray of radiotherapy is required. But high dose of RT is notorious to cause the late neurocognitive or endocrine dysfunction, especially for young children. So on the other hand, geminoma are known to be chemosensitive. But there are um, um, studies which show that chemotherapy alone um, carries a high risk of relapse. So with all these um, concepts, so people are now trying to combine both chemotherapy and radiotherapy together in the hope that chemotherapy will try to reduce the need for a high RT dose or a large RT volume. So there are several um, um, national protocols that uh, are talking on these as aspects. So the first one is the American protocol, so for the um, geminoma. So um, they have divided into two groups. The first group is standard radiotherapy, and for a localized disease, they will use the whole ventricular radiotherapy together with a involved together with a never mind together with a involved fuel boost um, for, uh, for um, the arm two um, they would um, um, ask the patients to um, uh, receive um, four cycles of chemotherapy. And in case if uh, the chemotherapy response is good, then they will try to reduce the dose to 30 gray. Thank you. 30 gray is a reduced dose and confining only to the tumor bed. So it's a reduced dose and reduced volume um, radiotherapy depending on the response to the chemotherapy. So, but unfortunately, this trial oh, has been stopped because of very slow accrual, and there's so far no published results. And for the Japanese group, um, the brain tumor study group in Japanese, well, they try to give patients three cycles of chemotherapy, the care combinations, and follow oh, oh, by whole ventricular irradiations with a low dose, 24 grade only. And it, it is irrespective of the response to the chemotherapy. So it is the purely uh, dose or reductions um, uh, protocols. And they, they had a very respectable five year overall survival of. 98%, but while well, their event risk survival is around 88%, mainly because there are some protocol violations. For those patients who are sticking, uh, who, who stick to the protocols, so the risk recurrence rate is low, 6% only, if they receive the whole ventricular radiotherapy. But for those patients who have protocol violations and receive less than the ventricular radiations, the response rate becomes very high, as high as 28%. So um, the Japanese group concluded that radiotherapy volume should involve at least the whole ventricular system in the treatment of geminoma, even in the presence of chemotherapy. So this is the French group. Um, which try to combine chemotherapy and a limited field radiation. The limited field is just a gross tumor with a margin. So, and they try to analyze the um, 60 patients in the pattern of relapse. And they find that in um, these 60 patients, 10 of them um, recur um, um, after the um, combined chemo and limited field ULT approach. And out of these 10 patients, actually, um, nine patients recurred in the ventricular systems, and one patient recurred in the optic um, chiasm areas. So these are the um, 
pictures. So and, um, some of the tumors recur at the third ventricles, some at the periventricular regions. One patient had a tumor recurrence encasing the optic nerve, and there's one tumor uh, recurring at the floor of the fourth ventricle. So this is the CIOPT uh, protocol, and they have reported the result in 2013. So in this protocol, they tried to uh, um, assign patients in a non-random fashion to either uh, cranial spinal RT full dose or induction chemotherapy followed by just a focal RT. So this is a non metastatic situation. And they, they find that when they try to compare these two arms, they, they found that for those patients who receive chemo and a focal RT, so seven out of um, 65 patients did recur um, and most of them recurred in the ventricular regions outside the primary RT field. Whereas for those patients who received radiation alone, which is in the form of cranial spinal irradiations, only four out of 125 patients recur. And all of this recurrence occurred in the primary tumor sites. So the, their five-year event rate survival or, um, for localized germinoma is 88% if they receive a chemo and a focal RT, and 97% if they just receive cranial spinal RT alone. So all these protocols, the results, tells us something. So um, there's a um, common phenomenon that will um, recurrence tends to occur in the intraventricular area if you do just a local field irradiations. So the use of ventricular field is apparently a must. So the current national protocols in USA, in Europe, and Japan tries to use the whole ventricular RT from now on. So let's switch gear to the non germinal germ cell tumor. So um, for non germinal germ cell tumor, apparently there's a diversion of the treatment protocols. So I just quote three um, national protocols here, the COG American protocol, Japanese protocols, and the CIOP protocols. So they all differ in uh, various aspects like the um, selection criteria for treatment. Some of the um, protocols will allow just a radiological diagnosis together with a marker diagnosis. But for Japanese group, they will mandate it, um, the, um, the use of, um, of tumor biopsy to attain the histological diagnosis. And they also differ in the fashions of the chemotherapies. Um, but most important of all, for uh, these three protocols, they all differ in the volume of the radiation therapies. As the COG group, they try to use uh, cranial spinal irradiations even for localized tumor, whereas for the CIOP group, they try to use uh, just in more field irradiations for localized disease. So there's a very a, a, a big um, discrepancies in terms of the radiation protocols. So, but what have we learned from all these protocols? For the Japanese group, we learned that um, there may be some um, uh, non germinal tumor that have inferior outcomes, like the choriocarcinoma, yolk sac tumor, or embryonal carcinomas. They may carry a worse prognosis as compared to the immature teratoma. So, and for the C up group, we learned that local irradiations may not be sufficient because um, with local irradiations alone, it seems that the uh, progression free survival is um, um, less than optimal. And for COG group, uh, we learned that well, carboplatin may replace its platin, um, and carboplatin is associated with a less electrolyte problems. And we also learned that second look surgery seems to be important because it can try to identify the growing teratoma syndromes from the incomplete tumor response. So in the future, so the um, COG group tries to activate a new protocols that will use uh, second look surgery and also they will try to um, um, reduce the RT volume. Instead of using a cranial spinal RT, they will try to use a whole ventricular RT in case of localized disease. Long-term complications is an issue, so people always blame radiotherapy for causing neurocognitive consequences, endocrinopathies, neurovascular complications, second malignancies. 
So we have a lot of data from adenoblastoma, but do we have data on germ cell tumor? So this is a um, paper from the Harvard group uh, reported in the year 2000. So uh, Thomas Merchant tried to some, um, um, reported 12 patients aged around 9 to 16 in, um, um, and tried to follow their IQ or before and after treatment. And um, he reported that actually um, there's no significant loss of either the verbal perf performance of full-scale I. IQ at five years after a simple cranial spinal RT up to 50 gray to tumor bed. So, and he, he also discovered that even before the treatment, patients would have already developed a lot of endocrinopathies, as much as 60%. And he hypothesized that because CNS germ cell tumor usually occurs in the older adolescent population, Treatment toxicity of cranial spinal irradiations per se may not be as significant as we expected. And it would be difficult to show that combined, chemo RT, combined chemotherapy and reduced radiotherapy is superior than the cranial spinal RT alone. However, this study did not address the problem of second malignancy. But how about second malignancies? This is a sheer data uh, from America. Um, 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 they try to look at the incidence of second cancers and also the all-cause mortality for patients between 1973 to 2005. And they discovered that for the all-cause mortality, there's a tenfold increase after uh, cranial spinal irradiation. And um, as for the um, death due to the stroke or the neurovascular problems, so germ cell tumor survivors who have a uh, as much as a 55 or 59-fold increase in the risk of death simply due to the stroke. So at 25 years, the cumulative incidence of second neoplasm is as high as 6%. So um, this um, paper tells us that for CNS germ cell tumor, well, although they have a very favorable cure rates, late recurrences, subsequent cancers, and stroke problems can significantly affect the long-term survival. So long-term follow-up is important. So, and we have a lot of strategies to reduce the RT complications. For example, reduce the dose, reduce the treatment volume. We can also use the more advanced technologies such as the 3D conformal, IMRT, the volumetric arc therapies, or tomotherapies. And we also explore the use of protons to reduce the dose to the normal organs. So these are the systems that um, the radiation oncologist commonly use, tomotherapies and the true beam systems with a very high precision to avoid geographical mist to the targets. And, and the, thick, the photos on the top is the proton systems. But why protons? So simply because proton has a very favorable physical advantage. So, um, with proton, so the dose who can be stopped just right after the tumor, as compared to the uh, ordinary photons. Photons, you have uh, exit dose that can go to the, the normal tissues, but protons, essentially, the exit dose is negligible. So it's a low exit dose. And this is a um, diagram trying to compare the conventional RLT on top, tomotherapy in the middle, and then protons at the bottom. For conventional RT, you have a high exit dose in the middle, the tumor, the, the X-ray comes from behind, and then the exit dose can damage the organs anterior to the spine. Even with tomotherapy, the conformity to the spine is improved, but then there may be dose to the peripheral parts of the body. But with protons, you can see from here, so the dose exactly stopped in front of the spinal cord. So you can spare the visceral organs anterior to the spinal cord. So not only is um, proton therapy important in cranial spinal irradiations, for ventricular radiations, you can also employ the, um, proton therapies. So this is um, dosimetric studies here, um, from one group in, um, in um, America. So they try to compare uh, the ordinary IMRT with different forms of protons. As you can see from here, the conformity of the high dose to the ventricle systems is much, much better for protons. 
and it is even better for the intensely modulated proton therapies. So the dose to the periphery, to the, the temporal lobe, to the other areas of a normal brain is much reduced. So these are all the strategies that we can use to reduce all, all the um, um, organ damage to the cranial system. So I cannot st stop without talking about something on the genomics. So, um, but for germ cell tumor, it is difficult because well, we have a scarcity of tumor specimen because many a time nowadays, we only make diagnosis based on tumor markers and the MRI. So the tumor biopsy specimens is uh, becoming rare and rare. But well, for this group, uh, an international collaboration group led by the um, Hilson group, they try to um, perform um, next generation sequencing and also SNP array and expression arrays on 62 patients and they can come up with um, some interesting finding. So as you can see from here, they have identified some common somatic mutations. So the kit and the KRAS mutations, somatic mutations, occurs in more than 50% of their patients. And apart from the KIT and the KRAS, actually, there's also a tendency of uh, the AKAT1 amplifications from the copy numbers. So, and this is also interesting to see that there is a subgroup of patients, mainly from the Japanese. They can identify a special um, um, uh, uh, germline variants. So this um, germline variants can explain why um, this uh, germ cell tumor can occur in puberty and also mainly in male population. So apart from the um, gene profiling, people also try to do the uh, microRNA profiling. The microRNA is an encoding RNA molecules that do not produce protein, but they try to modulate the protein coding genes. And the advantage of studying the microRNA is that uh, it is highly stable in bloodstream, so it can be monitored uh, um, um, during the course of the treatments. So um, when they try to do the uh, microRNA profiling, they find that so um, for the germ cell tumor, there's a high percentage of this microRNA in the clusters of 371 to 73, and also in other clusters in 302. So these markers are very specific for or, um, germ cell tumor, especially for non-germinous germ cell tumor. And um, also, there are also studies that um, can correlate the response of this um, microRNA level in the serum to the um, um, response, clinical response of the treatment. So uh, this microRNA seems to be a promising biomarker and it can be even more or specific and sensitive than the ordinary the AFP or the HCG and offer a potential for a greater uh, accuracy in terms of diagnosis and the treatment follow-up. So um, I'll conclude by offering mm, mm, some future challenges that we e encounter in the CNS germ cell tumor. So I think we have to um, explore the optimal timing extent of the surgery. So surgery is important to differentiate between viable to non-viable tumors. So we have to um, um, assess the exact efficacy of the reduced dose radiotherapy treatments in germ cell tumor without increasing the relapse rate. So, and we have to improve on the management outcome of the recurrent tumors after the standard treatments. How can we incorporate the new biomarkers into the future clinical trials is also important areas that we have to look into. And finally, I think we have to identify strategies that try to reduce the long-term outcome, long-term effect of the treatments. So thank you for your attention. So I think I have overrun a, a lot, and I don't have time for any Q&A, right? Okay, so no, no question. So uh, let's go to the third yeah, speaker. Okay.